Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Unpacking Possibility. I'm your host, Tracy Stein, and today I'm really delighted to have um, an outstanding clinician um, and also a good friend, Dr. Elizabeth Micus, here with us today. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Dr. Micus, and then I'm going to have her tell you her story because it's so compelling and relatable and important. Um, I can't wait for her to share her journey with you and, and how she can be helpful. So Dr. Elizabeth Micus is, uh, she's a, a clinical neuropsychologist. Is that fair to say? Okay. Yeah, a clinical psychologist. I have a lot of training in neuropsychology. You certainly so do. Both, yeah. You certainly do. Um, yeah. But Elizabeth experienced her, um, you know, her own fair, more than fair share of stressful life events and heartbreak. Um, so she knows the pain of personal heartbreak related to losing her four-year-old daughter to a rare cancer. And then um, subsequent to that, got divorced, had um, an engagement that didn't work out and other breakups. And um, she did something really novel and she used her knowledge of neuroscience and clinical psychology to really examine how people tend to get stuck in heartbreak and how they can use these empirically supported tools to help move through heartbreak heartbreak and start living a life that feels enjoyable um, and that uh, that is joyful once again. Um, so Dr. Micus is really passionate about helping others recover really rapidly from heartbreak and all other sorts of emotional pain using the latest neuroscience. And um, she actually developed and trademark an approach called emotional pain intervention. And she'll tell you a little bit about that today. Um, but Elizabeth's an expert in neuroplasticity, hypnosis, heartbreak, and she has a book coming out, Love Stuck, the Neuroscience of Healing Heartbreak. Um, so I'm going to actually stop talking and let you talk more about your journey, Elizabeth, but welcome. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Sure. It's wonderful to be here, Tracy. Um, it, I have a different message, I think about emotional pain and about terrible events, because there are so many losses, necessary and unnecessary losses in life. And most of the time when we hear people talk about it, and even psychologists and psychotherapists, um, self-help books are constantly comparing it to the Kubler-Ross stages for death and dying, right? The the courses are going to say that you have to feel this pain in order to move through the pain and to get to the other side. That's kind of the general wise advice. But then they also link it to wading through the stages of loss. And, you know, there's the shock and denial and anger and bargaining and um, depression and acceptance, right? So those Kubler-Ross stages, many people will recognize um, were the ones that when she was working with terminally ill patients and extended this model to everything, every kind of loss from, you know, uh, the end of a close relationship to the end of a romance to the end of a project or your career or dream uh, that we all go through this, you know, denial about it. And then you, you know, convince yourself that, uh, your partner's not coming back and going through numbness. Um, so I started to say, since these stages aren't linear and, you know, people are sometimes angry, sometimes not, sometimes sad, sometimes, um, you know, not wanting to believe that it happened. Maybe we should start to understand the neurobiology of how we fall in love and break up in order to guide what we would do to help people recover from it. Um, and so with that, I started to include a theory for the whole brain, you know, how it operates in this and, and use real research instead of just kitchen tail wisdom. And this happened to me and hurry up and love yourself and move on and let go. Because to understand the brain, you would know how very difficult that is for people to do. And that I wanted to normalize that when you're going through a breakup, 
you are going to feel some emotional pain. And then, you know, using the science, or I could just say a brain-based perspective, let's look at where those intense emotions are coming from, right? It, especially if they keep coming, like if you feel better already, uh, but I don't, I don't want people to think that it was necessary to suffer to and go through these stages, right? Or wait for time to heal. Because I started to read things like, well, if you were in a relationship like 20 years, well, it's going to take you like half uh, that amount of time to get over it. So that would mean 10 years of suffering, which then I started to think not only is, you know, this kind of suffering bad, this post-romantic stress is actually not very helpful to the physical body. Right. You know, we look at broken heart syndrome and how people can inflammation and even damage to the organ systems. And we know chronic stress isn't good for the body. So I'm like, no, no, we have to really start to look at a different way of looking at what needs to happen to accelerate resolution. And also, let's keep the brain in mind. You know, Tracy, um, I know you're trained in hypnotherapy. So, um, Part of what we understand with um, non-conscious things like reaching the unconscious is that a lot of the brain operates in these ways where it's without our choice or decision. And definitely where emotions come from (laughs) in the brain has a lot to do with that. So I I start with that, just normalizing, um, you know, let's look at what's causing your pain. And so in my method, and you call it emotional pain intervention, it's a neuroplastic healing system that helps you, you know, be in a position to really transform heartbreak from the bottom up, not just changing your mindset and thinking, oh, if I can say affirmations and look at this in a new way, then I can get totally free. But how do I get my hands on the control knob of some of these automatic things that start to happen with emotions and sensations like panic uh, and that I can't sleep and, and even have cravings and wish to see the person, even though they might not want anything to do with you, you can't stop thinking about them. Um, so the model starts with simple neuroeducation. You know, this is your... Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Elizabeth. As you were talking, I was thinking what I would love to do is just have you take a moment and explain some terms, because I know some people listening will underst- understand what you mean by neuroplasticity and neuroplastic, but other people might need um, to oh, absolutely. explanation. Yeah, when I said it's a neuroplastic healing system we've learned a lot about the brain and we know that one of the way the brain, the brain changes is through experience. Right. And so that if we can harness neuroplasticity, which is the brain's innate ability to change itself by directing things like attention and these non-conscious systems of how we think, feel, and do things, then we can really set things in motion. Like we're actually creating what we want Instead of like what I say is getting played by your brain after a breakup into emotional states or thinking in a certain way or having your, you know, beliefs get so limited that you can't even see the future of love. So this is a Nobel Prize winning research of Eric Kendall that really started us knowing that, you know, we can change with experience and definitely, um, you know, life is an experience. A breakup is an experience. And the the breakup experience can change your brain into these painful states. You know, I call it post-romantic distress. Like after I know that I can't get back with you, I can't get my brain to stop doing things. But to keep it simple, I just tell people it's the lower brain, you know, that runs sort of the uh, the brainstem and, and runs our stress system. And I just call it bottom brain so that you don't have to memorize terms like, you know, amygdala. Um, it's just an emotional brain. And so that it's helpful for people to understand that you don't make a decision to feel this way. It comes from lower in the brain. And when your brain does that, it's not to make you feel bad, but it wants to communicate and it even starts doing stuff for us. It like initiates these survival actions of fight, flight, freeze, sometimes flop, so that 
you know, you're not feeling bad. You, your brain is responding, you know, to something and doing it quickly. Right. So I want people to understand that when your emotions communicate with you, they can't send you a text message. They instead make you feel things like sensations in your body. And kind of the first thing bottom brain wants to know is please understand, you know, and so I need to connect with my body and kind of acknowledge this message instead of doing what we characteristically love to do as humans. I want to ignore it. I want to avoid it. I want to struggle um, with the emotion, maybe add meaning to it, try to figure out myself, the world relationships, you know, um, need to do something different. So I, I teach this method of how we connect with what's going on in the brain to affect it and then use tools and techniques that come from the research on how do you change your brain? Like what's neurointerventional, even to change the state it's in, like, you know, doing something with your brain can change how you feel immediately. Right. Um, And putting that information in a way that they can influence what they're experiencing instead of going into those old patterns of ignoring or avoiding or, you know, just struggling with it and making it worse. And and, and I want to just recap for people listening, because a lot of, and I know you've seen this in clinical practice quite a lot, because this is, especially because this is your specialty area, but I think anybody who's been through a tough breakup can know, especially if it wasn't your choice, but even if it was, mm-hmm. and it was a practical choice, but it just doesn't feel great that the, like you mentioned before, the feeling of craving either mm-hmm. the experience of the person when things were good or the, the experience of what you hoped the relationship would be like. Um, so that longing, the desire to t- try to distract and avoid those mm-hmm. feelings, but they're still there and your body absolutely does re- react. I mean, you can feel ill. Yeah, um, exactly. So to, to spending too much time thinking about a relationship that really isn't going to come back or wasn't great for you. And, and, it, you know, as I'm saying this, I can think of like probably half a dozen people who six months later, a year later, two years later, still feel um, that, that, that grief and that pull. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm, I love that you brought that up, but I'm wondering if you can talk about some of the, the steps or techniques or the changes that people can make to kind of shift out of that. And actually, if you feel comfortable, how you shifted out of that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so, well, let's start with, cause you brought up sort of the addictive piece too. And, and that's, you know, the work of Helen Fisher and anatomy of love kind of begins to see as when we fall in love, it's really a primitive drive in the brain. And so that if that reward is no longer available, a lot of what the research is showing is it's no different than recovering from a cocaine addiction. And we don't think of that because we sort of romanticize and glorify it, but for the brain. So see, it's very different. Let's take everything we've read about it and it is wonderful feeling. It's a perfectly wonderful thing, but it also operates in the brain very similar to addiction when it's no longer available like a high that you're no longer able to get. Yeah. Or that you just can't get the fix. You can't get the reward. I mean, the reward is getting to engage with someone, seeing them, you know, releases all kinds of neurochemicals. I mean, from physical stuff like, um, uh, you know, dopamine, of course, that's the feel good. Like, remember this person, remember how good it feels, but even from physical um, um, touch, and uh, sexual connection and lust circuitry that all really gets, you know, wired in a certain way in bottom brain. And in the lower brain, it doesn't have a time keeping uh, capability that our higher prefrontal cortex has. So, I mean, the way it was is the way it sort of will, you know, constantly be unless we're doing things to kind of tame and train that circuitry that that's no longer available. Like there, I do things with people. um, A simple technique is this name it to tame it. 
where we take a negative emotion, which is usually experienced more as a right brain emotion or just raw emotion in the amygdala. And we cross hemispheres to give it a label. And labeling it actually calms the lower brain. So many of the techniques that I'm teaching people, I call them play the brain for change tools and techniques, is we're going to name it to tame it and train it. And that helps change what's going on in the brain with things like emotions such as, you know, anger and fear, but also one that's deeply connected to um us, uh, which is whenever there's a perceived disconnection from somebody that you love or that you're connected to, separated from, that it starts this involuntary panic and grief. And we see it in mammals. And I know, Tracy, you have many pets in your home and always adopting and loving them. And um, when when separated, like if you lock one of your dogs out of the house, I mean, they're going to whine and call out and cry out so that you can come get them. I had a cat that was trapped in my roof. My neighbor's cat, a cat ran up into my attic and was trapped and could not come back down. We had to cut her out of the soffit uh, in the roof. Like I had somebody make a hole so we could drop the cat into a basket. But If my friend and I didn't hear the cat and I don't have one, it would have died there in the heat, had no way of getting out. Um, So this ability to, you know, call the loved one home, call out and cry out is very adaptive. It's in our survival mechanism. So while a lot of us know about, you know, fight and flight and fear and rage, we hardly ever really acknowledge that we have emotional systems and bottom brain for that too, like a separation alarm. And if you know the reason you're separated and it's okay, you know, that then the alarm is kind of just malfunctioning. So in addition to maybe craving and wanting your ex, it's sort of like, well, how do I shut off the panic that ensues when they're just not going to be here? And I've had that, you know, simply in my life, Um, even um, being separated for a few days and, you know, not knowing where a child is, you know, because they didn't call you when they went to a concert or, you know, checking in, you know, that not only does it have this unsettling effect in our bottom brain emotions, it also makes us kind of um, have racing thoughts about what it could be. And typically the way that area of our brain operates, we think the worst first, unfortunately. And so we can then get more emotional pain from imagining things that aren't even happening. So helping people get in touch with what's really going on in bottom brain is the first part of this model. And then techniques like the, you know, name it to tame it, but also doing things that um, will be calming to the brain and body. The first stage of neuroplasticity is I can't change the brain in a state that it's in. I have to bring it into a state of calm and optimize it for new learning And so those techniques, simple things like um, I teach people about this nerve that connects the brain and body, the 10th cranial nerve, the vagus nerve, and then have them put one hand on their belly and one hand on their chest and breathe in a way that would activate the bottom hand. They take more of a diaphragmatic breath, you know, right? So if you've been singing or playing a wind instrument, you know how you can feel it you know, through breathing in and then hold and then exhale and letting all the air release. And then if they can notice that their bottom hand is moving more than the top hand, then that's usually more of a calm centering breath, right? So breath work. Yeah. Beautiful way to engage this non-conscious systems uh, practiced in, in many of the, you know, contemplative traditions, as well as the neuroscience that supports that uh, for all kinds of things, hypnosis, mindfulness, meditation. So we know it works, but it works because it plays the brain and because we can change the state. Uh, so those things are definitely um, coming up in this model. 
And, and then the other thing, in addition to that, is looking at what um, memories come up, you know, what kind of things cue you. Like if you always went to, you know, uh, a sports event and it's that time of year. And, you know, now you don't go like even seeing things on television. It's an indication that what the brain had predicted, like, oh, yeah, we're going to go here together. We're going to do this. We're going to have meals and go to these parties. And then that stops. And so what happens is that's sort of an unexpected for how our brain is operating. Right. Our brain is freaking out, saying, wait, like what I'm predicting and trying to match is not available, you know, and that sets off some of these same emotions, you know. Elizabeth, yeah. I, I, I have about a million questions and thoughts as you're yeah, talking. Yeah, go ahead. You bring up so many really important points, and I think a lot of people don't think about them consciously, but as they hear you talking, I think something, many things are going to resonate. One thing that stood out is, you know, you use the example of, you know, we're thinking about in terms of loss, in terms of breakup, but certainly um, you were saying, even if somebody's gone for a few days, I was thinking a lot of people I know now their children are going off to college and, Mm -hmm. or if somebody's child say moves to another city for a job or something that can trigger that feeling of heartbreak. Mm-hmm. In a way, that feeling of loss, it sounds like you're saying. Well, it, it triggers the stuff that is involving this panic grief system. So s- certainly feeling anxious and kind of restless and, you know, wanting to find them kind of the, the panic part is to kind of search and seek and want to find somebody um, new onset panic attacks. We think about this and, you know, uh, people presenting for the first time with like anxiety that comes out of the blue can also have a root in this. Oh, there was a change in how connected I was to someone. Like I was hearing about here, I'm in a military area in Northwest Florida where people get deployed. So they're not getting deployed today, but they might be deployed in six months, but they just told their spouse, that uh, deployment is coming. And then all of a sudden she started to have panic attacks, you know, heart racing, pounding, you know, can't breathe, kind of felt dizzy out of the blue. And you go to a cognitive therapist and they might say, well, what were you thinking about? You know, you need to change the way you think because then, well, she wasn't thinking. I mean, the alarm turned on. And so many people, when I start to talk about these primitive emotions, they're really emotion action systems and they're in our lower brain. They're not our choice. We didn't decide to have them. And then that really normalizes it for people, Tracy. So, and I want people to know that I never want you to think this is you or that you're stuck with it. I want you to just to see it as something that your brain has been doing and really it thinks it's doing it to help you because the information it has is engaging these danger threat defense systems, right? Which we don't really need, but they're on and they're on by the way, faster than we can think. So, you know, these terms like amygdala hijack or, you know, the information going to the lower brain, the short path, and then later, like 500 milliseconds reaching the prefrontal cortex where, you know, we think and tell time, right, and choose and can, you know, use, you know, higher brain things to Um, help us deal with impulses and emotions. Really, that's the hallmark of an effective therapy is that you really regain your ability for healthy emotional regulation. Like almost all good therapy does that. We do it different ways. But in the brain-based way, that's the main target. I'm, I'm always helping people tune in how much emotional pain is going on when you think of that or when, you know, something comes up, you watch something on television or you see a Facebook post. And so with a neuroplastic approach, they can start to rewire what their brain is doing rather than just be reactive to it, you know, try to avoid it. And in some ways, when we avoid stuff, it makes it worse because we're teaching the brain there's more danger about it, like get away from it instead of moving into it and beginning to 
you know, relate to it differently. So that to me is a, a huge step in giving people back um, the power to change their brain. And so they get a mind that works for them so much better when they keep the whole brain in mind and they target the brain, the bottom brain, emotions changing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and something else you said before that I think is really important for pe people to know, and it sounds so simple when you talk about it, but I think people may not realize it in the moment, is that you have tools for helping people to tune in and name what's going on and start making a shift and learn, right? That neuroplastic kind of yeah. process. But it's much harder to, to change the reaction when you are in panic mode. And so mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're teaching people to use their innate wiring, stimulating that 10th cranial nerve, the, the vagus nerve. Yeah, the vagus, vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. With their something as simple and powerful as belly breathing, diaphragmatic yeah. breathing, like how babies breathe, where their lower abdomen expands out when they inhale and relaxes back when they exhale. And just doing that is calming. And that's when they can take in more of with their more thinking logical brain is trying mm -hmm. to help them with. Right. That would come back online, but first you have to deal with the, you know, essentially you're having an emotional pain response. And so your brain is in a survival mode and it's already causing you to be things with sensations are happening. You certainly don't feel comfortable in your skin when you're in that. And even movements like in fear, we typically freeze and move away from something kind of retreat. And in rage, we're kind of moving forward. And in the panic grief, we're kind of moving forward to connect. You know, if you see a two-year-old in a shopping mall and they've been separated from their parents, I mean, you're going to hear them crying and calling. And that's how mall security usually would find them and make the announcement, right? So, you know, when people are crying, when someone's departing, um, you know, someone giving a eulogy and they want to say these, you know, things to celebrate their life, but they can't stop having an emotional response. See, the more we don't want the emotion, it's like the more we get caught up in it. So, you know, with my system, they're learning new ways to relate to it because normally we struggle. We do. I mean, it's like that Chinese, um, finger puzzle. Do you remember yes. those? The kind of made out of the bamboo. It's like you put your fingers in and then you want to get out so desperately and you know, you're stuck and you want to get out. Well, it, it just locks you more. And so my term love stuck is really to show how these patterns can just play you and keep doing it. And unless you have a new way to, you know, interact with that and alter it, then it could get worse. And that even blocks people long-term from love because not only is it uncomfortable and they don't want to feel vulnerable, they're almost predicting that the past will be the future. Like, because I had this happen, I really don't want it to happen again. So even the stuff we start to think and focus on, you know, believe in, have rules about, and attach meanings to experience about that complicates the information that our brains are having to process every day. Do you know what I'm saying? So that's how another way we can get stuck is not just in the emotions that we're resisting and, and want to withdraw from or struggle with, but in everything we tell ourselves that in a lot of this thinking as we're learning the cognitive neuroscience is it's very automatic thinking and you don't have a way to really not get played by it very well unless you have a way to change what it's doing and you know the freedom to uh, veto it at times so your veto power is more in your top brain and your prefrontal cortex as is willpower and self-control and so many things. So I introduce people to their brain in a simple way. And then everything is about, you're going to learn what to do. And you're learning the steps of neuroplasticity to tune. 
So you target the emotional pain. And then, like you said, you do something to unburden the nervous system from the state that it's in that just got initiated. And then you'd be doing something new in the way that could be healing or transforming in the next step. You know, even telling yourself you're safe, even though your brain is doing this and doing the breathing can be a great reset tool for people. And that's one that I share with a lot of people while you're breathing, just say, you know, I'm okay. Even though my brain was doing that a minute ago, I'm really okay. You know, returning back to calm. And then the best part about this system is it's evidence-based and proven, which means it gets in the E-step evidence that you've been able to do something to temporarily influence your brain or permanently rewire it through some kind of transformational technique that I've taught and you and we've done together either or you've done it by yourself. So that is for clients to say, I can remember when I couldn't fall asleep at night, I was crying myself to sleep every night. And now I get a good night's sleep. Like, I don't know, you know, something shifted and I really don't go back into that, you know, story or that emotion. I don't have panic attacks. And to me, I love that. I love to see that, you know, they get it, but also that they were able to change their brains. And I always give them credit because I'm not the one that's doing it. We kind of do it in collaboration. Um, But the model helps them see what can be done based on what we're learning about the brain and change and even rapid change, which you mentioned it in the beginning of the intro, I've spent, you know, 30 years doing rapid change processes like uh, hypnosis, uh, eye movement reprocessing, tapping, uh, neurofeedback, you know, things that in a one single session can make a difference. And I, in fact, had that done with me. I used um, a hypnosis session to clear the, some of the regret and guilt and grief about the passing of my daughter. And I didn't really know I was even having that until I went back to work at a hospital after living at a hospital with her and, and Shans for about a year that all the, the bells that would go off, you know, the codes and, and sirens and things, they would trigger a fight flight response. And when uh, I was talking to my mentor that taught me clinical hypnosis, we were at dinner one night, he goes, how are you doing? I said, I think, I'm, you know, I'm good. But at work, you know, sometimes when I hear the codes and the bells, I really get into more of a, you know, a fight flight activation. And we went back from the restaurant to his hotel, did a short session, maybe an hour or two, I can't remember, but I know I came out of there really feeling totally cleared, like I could talk about it. And when I went back to work, my bottom brain emotional reaction wasn't fight flight to those noises, you know, and somehow that got linked. And what I want people to understand is that's how our brain stores emotional memories, right? By the emotion, by the fear, rage, or panic, grief, and also, um, by association and repetition. And he did something in that, you know, experience with me that changed all that. And so that too, I want people to know is available. And we're starting to understand more of a science of therapeutic memory reconsolidation, how we turn a bottom brain emotional memory into a top brain, you know, long-term memory or narrative. And when that transformation or change can happen, it's amazing for people. So you don't have to be defined by what happened, you know, in terms of the stuff you tell yourself, but you also don't have to have these bottom brain reactions to traumatic events and even heartbreak. Elizabeth, I want to ask you a little bit more about that, if I can, because, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm going to generalize because people say all kinds of things when someone either goes through a breakup or has a, a loss, um, mm-hmm. like a, a different kind of loss, a more permanent kind of loss, like the, the, yeah. the death of a loved one. Yeah, they're, they're both losses. But, you know, I think a lot of times when a relationship ends for a period of time, there's a part of the self that says, well, maybe you never know, or maybe it'll, we'll get back together or, 
people will tell you, well, you know, you'll find somebody else. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's that idea that even if it's only intellectual, that something will happen that will ease the heartbreak. Right. And I think we can hold on to that for a long time. But with well, something outside of them, you're saying, you know, right, right. Like something will change. They'll either come back to you or you'll find someone right. new, you know, the, the best way to right. get over somebody is to get under someone, you know, joke and, and, but that's a, that's like an external fix, right? right? Like we're really dependent on something outside of us, you know, happiness research shows that as well. You know, the kind of, you need to be happy for no reason, not really attaching your happiness to something. Right. Right. So, yeah, it's an internal adjustment or fix. Absolutely. Yeah. But what I think is that in the moment, people can hold on to that saying, well, you know, something might happen to quote reverse this Mm -hmm. outside of me. Again, whether the person comes back to them and they rekindle the relationship or, or they find somebody new. But when someone you love dies, especially your child, which is in its own category. Mm hmm there is this incredible seeking and longing and yet this understanding that in this lifetime, that is not going to happen. And, you know, and, and I, and I'm saying this, you know, for people I know who have lost Mm -hmm. a child, I think for some people, it's hard to even imagine that they could ever not feel that, that overwhelming grief. And, and, and I would, if you're comfortable, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about that because it's not that you were just pretty much fine because you're a psychologist and you know all this. It was mm-hmm. still a traumatic thing for you. And and I wonder if you could talk yeah, and, about how the mechanism of change. Okay. Yeah. Well, and I guess one of the things we have to start with is a lot of people believe that when something bad happens, it is that that causes them to be different. I mean, in terms of how they feel emotionally, right? And I call that sort of um, blame-based perspective. You know, this person's doing this and this is what's causing me to be angry. I lost this job or person or child and this is what's producing... Uh, this emotional pain and other people, they have more of a uh, a shame-based perspective. Like I'm looking at this as something's wrong with me. I lack something. I'm not as lucky as other people. Like I'm defective, broken. Um, and, And both of those perspectives, I think, can lead to a lot of pain and ongoing stuckness. And that's why I share a brain perspective because it's something not in the event itself, the event is over. It, it's something that the brain is either doing um, for some response having to do with survival circuitry, like what was going on with my bells and whistles at the hospital evoking this, or some kind of additional meaning, and maybe even a distorted meaning, like I didn't do enough Uh, someone's to blame. I didn't get to say goodbye. They're not getting to do what other kids get to do. You know, there has to be more data that's creating the experience of what is hurting people. And so I'm never going to assume because I went through this painful loss of a child that I know what anybody else's brain is doing exactly. But I'm very interested in understanding what about it is most upsetting to you at this moment. And by asking that with some curiosity and acceptance, because I never judge anybody about it, we can kind of see where it's caught up and, and would it be okay to be okay, even though this happened? You know, and even Oprah Winfrey has written, you know, with, um, Bruce Perry, this, it's what happened to you, right? Like what happened to you is kind of the key question. Um, And, but it's more than that. It's, and what happened to you and how did it imprint into your brain in terms of the emotional memory, the thoughts, the beliefs that you have now, what did it leave you with? You know, Um, 
So I'm interested in transforming that for people in as little as one session. That's what I've spent my you know career doing for people. Um, and I think it's that belief that what we're learning about the brain and especially things like post-traumatic stress is it's really a disorder of memory too, right? And we did therapy for probably, you know, 50 to 75 years without really even understanding anything about memory. There's different types of memory, these more bottom brain implicit kind of memories, and then the longer autobiographical narrative memory. I mean, that that's a, a you know valuable insight. So we want to figure out where people are in pain or stuck and help them because I don't see any value in chronic stress. Um, I don't, I don't think, you know, animals don't have it, you know, because they don't have as much complicating thoughts or memories coming up as we do. But I think we have a brain that is capable of changing and that we can be very free of misery no matter what's happened in any moment, you know, you can be way more instrumental in changing your state. You know, it's sort of like people say, you know, shit happens, then shift happens. But a lot of people don't understand how to do it. Or also like what you're bringing up, I don't know if it's okay. I don't, I, I thought that because this happened, I was meant to suffer. Um, I thought that was part of an overall, you know, punishment or something that I deserved to get. And that this became my identity and my existence is all that. And so they don't really have any other way of thinking about it or, you know. So you're helping people identify the feelings and identify the narrative that they have. That is like you just said, for example, I don't deserve to be happy or now I have to be suffering or I have to feel guilty. Mm -hmm. And that is separate. You're helping people understand that that is actually separate from the event itself, from the loss itself. Yeah. And that people can learn to create a, another understanding that shifts that narrative. And it's not, it's not lying. It is, it is pointing out things that are actually true and adaptive so that the yeah. narrative shifts. Is that accurate right. to say? Yeah, it, actually. Yeah. I mean, that's a good way to say it. And another way, you know, is to be mindful that um, you are not what your brain is doing or what it has been doing so that your identity, who you are, what you want to create and have in your life and, and even love life is essentially way more up to you. But when you don't feel okay because of, you know, inner unrest and these sensations, then it's hard to have that conscious top brain creative capacity. And so I really want to help people optimize their brains to be in that mode. And I, when I started doing this work, I also developed a, are you love stuck quiz you know, to have people take it to see what part of your brain, top, middle, and bottom has been most activated by the breakup so that we can design brain interventional techniques that would work with that area of the brain. Some people simply need to get back in their top brain, you know, mindset to plan a future and think more <clears throat> consciously about what are you looking for? Are you just wanting to be with somebody or are you really looking at, you know, a, a love, love relationship, you know, somebody else that has love that would bring it to you. And then you could share your love with them so that it's a match on that state, or you just, I don't want to be alone. And I'll take the first person that comes along, even if they're not loving, it doesn't matter. I just need love. So I'm going to love everybody. So designing that you know, more of a conscious, what are you looking for? Who's your ideal match in a partner? But that's so hard for people to do if they have all these emotions coming up and if they have all these really automatic and, and habitual and irrelevant thoughts where they compare to others. And so the quiz helps you see, you know, maybe where you're most stuck 
in these brain systems. And then we can design things, you know, individualize it before what are your patterns, you know, but I use that same system working with anyone. If somebody came to see me for panic attacks and it had nothing to do with a heartbreak um, or like you said, a, a loss of a child, a loved one, you know, a pet. I just lost my Pomeranian, 13 years old, midnight, passed away. So um, sorry. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask and I didn't, I didn't know that midnight had passed. As much yeah, as she it. had. And it, that was just a big surprise because I had a healthy senior dog wellness checkup in October. You know, her labs are great. And then, you know, she had this hacking cough and, you know, they found masses. It wasn't like a trachea collapse, which is a common thing for Pomeranians, you know, and so a difficult, you know, saying goodbye, you know, to a just cherished uh, pet. And there's so much love we get from our pets. I call it bottom brain mammal love. Like it's unconditional, but, you know, somebody could be, sitting there and have a terrible day. And then, you know, your kitty or your pup just sits on your lap and they're relaxed and you're finding yourself relaxed. I mean, look at how we're using um, them with the military. I mean, these people can't go to Walmart, but if they have a, you know, a a pet with them, you know, um, emotional uh, support, in that way of mammalian connection, you know, equine therapy, horses so limbically in tune, bottom brain to bottom brain. I grew up riding horses, so I'm a big believer in mammal love, you know, and I, I just think that, that that's another way that the brain heals is through attachment and connections with others and helping people find those healthy connections can be so brain altering and life transforming. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I, I think some people listening know this, uh, and others probably don't, but we, um, had to put our dog Cosmo down. He got unexpectedly very ill and it was just a few weeks of horror at awfulness. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you know, that was, you know, like I, you know, a lot of the the feelings I've had, you know, lo- losing a person in my life, of course, I, you know, had, this is my little boy. So, you mm-hmm. know, guilt, what I could have done, you know, rumination, you know, just, you know, the, the, the feeling of seeking, even though he's not there and, you know, yeah. longing for the feeling, you know, he used to sleep next to me. So um, yeah, absolutely. And it, it's, nothing we do is going to protect us from the pain of loss. It, it, and I don't think we're meant to feel nothing when we experience loss. I mean, we, we right. are meant to experience something, but the idea is for us to be functional and live in the present and create a future rather than drowning in, 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 in being perennially stuck because that mm-hmm. doesn't serve anyone Sometimes we like, and you were talking before about the unconscious and how often we have all these unconscious kind of scripts about how we're allowed to be in the face of loss. You know, are we, can we be a good person and still, you know, lessen our grief or Mm -hmm. create a life that's going forward? And, and I, and I love that you talk about, you know, what I'm hearing when you're talking is about this bi-directional relationship between the body and the mind using Mm -hmm. the body with that vagus nerve stimulation, that diaphragmatic breathing to calm the mind and using the mind to reframe and understand the narrative in a different way or craft a, a, a different, more healthy narrative. And that can be so calming to the body and ease the symptoms of panic and, and weightiness. Um, And, you know, it's grounded in science. It's very real. And people can start living again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, animals have this way. They can reset way quicker than us because they don't have all that information about, you know, judgments and meanings about things. So they go through experiences. <clears throat> but I don't think they would want us to suffer or remember them as the way they died. 
You're you're one thousand percent right. And you know, good people yeah. as well. Um, yeah, I love exactly. That your work really helps people to to recover from the honestly the trauma of so many mm-hmm. losses and things. Mm-hmm. And I love that it's you talk about getting unstuck because it's exactly right. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth, I'm sure there were things that I didn't ask you that I should have, or things that, you know, other things that you wanted to elaborate on on, or share about your work or how people can find you. Um, I don't know if your quiz is publicly available still or um, workshops you're doing, anything. Well, yes, just this playing the brain for love. Like, I want there to be more love in the world. And I think we can get there with brain science. Uh, I do have a quiz. It's available for free. It's on my website, Neuroscience of Heartbreak, or my name, Dr. Elizabeth Micas, whatever's easier. My name's hard to spell. It's M-I-C-H-A-S. And so you can just go to Neuroscience of Heartbreak and see the quiz um, and get results to see, you know, what, which one of these brain systems is more activated and maybe keeping you more in these patterns of uh, feeling and thinking and reacting or, or doing or not doing things. I don't want people to be blocked from really giving and receiving love. And I think a lot of times when we've been hurt and we're stuck that we are, you know, subconsciously blocked and we need to give them the freedom um, to have their hearts open to love and this mind body connection. The vagus nerve is really a brain heart, you know, connector and communicator. And so we want to open that flow. And in my work, I say, we're going to heal the brain to mend your heart for amazing love. So that's what I wanted to leave them with. I'm going to be doing labs. Like we're, uh, we've got this get unloved stuck weekend lab that I'll be doing about once a month. I'll spend the weekend five hours on Saturday and Sunday going through everything in the system and the tools and techniques that people need. I'll I'll teach it live and answer questions and look at your quiz, you know, so they they get kind of some idea of what they need to focus on to break free from heartbreak. I love that. And yeah. are these labs for clients I mean, for psychotherapy or for professionals wanting to understand this system? Well, no, they're, they're, they're for people that are heartbroken. I've been training psychotherapists for about 10 years. I have other courses and trainings for psychotherapists, but this one is really designed to figure out where are you love stuck and then what do we need to do to get your brain calm, clear, and free to love. Um, so it's designed uh, into six modules that will cover lots of experiential exercises, and we do it together. Um, time to ask questions. You know, I just want—I couldn't see everybody. I mean, I've done one-on-one work, and I just wanted to make it very cost-effective. People don't want to spend years going to psychotherapy, so we're going to go into the neuro lab with me, get a brain-based model, get the play the brain for change techniques and tools you need, and then figure out where you're stuck. And then you go out and and you do it. Um, So, and I also have, if you just have bottom brain, you know, you want to learn about the vagus nerve and how to get calm. I've got a very simple on-demand course called Break Free from Heartbreak that's available for people. So um, I love that. All at your website. Um, and I'll put links to your website um, in the show notes. But yeah, thanks. Yeah. Elizabeth, again, I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been so great uh, catching up with you and seeing you and, and having you share all of your uh, wisdom and knowledge. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you. Take care. So this has been another episode of Unpacking Possibility. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to like and share and follow. And until next time, be well. 